Let's go to Galatians chapter 2 in God's Word. And they're going to put it on the screen for you. It says this, that then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. And I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, uh, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they may bring us back into slavery. So it's important to look there. There's people that are watching and seeing the freedom that you live in. They're jealous of it, don't like it, and they want to bring you back into slavery. Verse 5 says this. It says, uh, to them we did not yield. We didn't yield into submission, even for a moment. Like we didn't even think about it. We didn't even consider it. But it says, we did not yield even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel may be preserved for you. I'd love to preach from this title, Stop Stealing My Freedom. Stop Stealing My Freedom. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray in Jesus' name. God, there's some people that are struggling today. There's some people in bondage. There's some people, God, that that need to be set free. And I pray that today, mindsets, addictions, problems, challenges, God, will fall off. And God, they'll find freedom in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, everybody said together, amen. Amen. You guys can grab a seat this morning. You already look beautiful. And I know God's going to speak to you. What an incredible church we have here at Victory City Church. Kristen and Jen, we love you guys. Praying for you all. And, uh, and uh, if you're joining us online, know that you're part of our family as well. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, or Spotify, or whenever you listen, even if it's three months later. We love you too. Um, can I tell you a story? Is that okay? I'm, I'm going to open up with a story. I was traveling for one of the first times overseas, and anytime I get new currency from another country, I'm always fascinated by it because sometimes American money can be kind of boring, um, even though I wouldn't mind having a lot of that boring thing. But I'm saying, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, when you travel, you're always like so fascinated that the stories they tell and the people's faces on other currency and then the different shapes. Um, of coins that they have. And I remember traveling as a college student overseas for the first time. And I don't know if you're like me. I'm not like this anymore. But I would always tell myself, I'll just pack and stay up late, and then I'll sleep on the plane, Um, which is a lie from the pit of hell because I never sleep on the plane. And so I go to make this trip. I've been up for 24 hours. My voice started to fail. Um, And I stay up all night long on the plane, and I land in London, and I go to the currency exchange, and I change over $500 because I want to, you know, I want to spend money there. And so when I do that, I'm, I'm sitting in the airport lounge, and I'm looking at all the money and, uh, and just kind of studying the different bills. Uh, and what ended up happening is I started to drift and fall asleep because I'd been up for almost 36 hours, and I fall asleep with the money in my lap. And then uh, I suddenly wake up to this really polite British lady on the announcer, ding, American Airlines flight, for you know, you know, I can't do it, I'm not Siri. I have my Siri set to British, because um, I feel fancy. And so, uh, so I wake up, and guess what is not in my lap anymore? My wallet or my money. That means that somebody felt the need to walk by me. So I was probably drooling, mouth open. How many of you guys are never cute sleepers, right? Like how many of y'all married a cute sleeper and they're just like angel cherubs? You're like, you know, your mouth is open, drool. I probably was doing that. They saw $500 on my lap and just decided to take it. And how many of you guys know that the best thieves in life, you never notice them, you never feel them. Uh, the best pickpockets, they just slide in and out, and suddenly your wallet is gone. How many of you guys know when someone breaks into your house, they do not knock on your bedroom door and say, hey, we're going to be here about 15 minutes. Just want to give you all a heads up. Uh, we're the valuables, right? Like if you leave a laptop or a phone in your car, they don't leave a note on your windshield after they've broken in, taken it and said, hey, if this is really an inconvenience, just call me and I'll return it. How many of you guys know the best thieves in life uh, are never noticed. Uh, They always slip in and slip out, and although you can see the evidence of them being there, you don't notice them while they're there, right? Any thieves in the house? You like, yeah, I'm amen to that. I I know. No? All right. I'd love to ask a question to you and and kind of think about and consider this is, is when in your life did you feel the most free? 
Like when was the moment or season in your life did you feel the most free? Was it that sweet moment of three months between high school and college? where you were out of high school and you hadn't started college yet. You had a job that paid you just enough money so you could play without responsibility. Come on, how many guys, it was high, it was right there in that moment. Or was it college when you got to move 500 miles away from your parents and nobody could know what you were doing and you got to stay up as late as you want, hang out with who you wanted, sleep in till 2 p.m., skip all the classes that your parents were paying for, but you were free. What about right after college when you didn't have kids, you weren't married yet, you had a big girl or big boy job, and so you had a good amount of money, no responsibility, you had that one-bedroom apartment, and life was good. And then kids came in, and they told you how to spend your money. And you were like, man, if I could only be single again. Come on, how many married people? You imagine and dream. What would single life be like? I know you married people do it because I'm married. Um, or what about, what about that, that, that moment right when you retire and, and you, you haven't gotten too old, you're still kind of like right in that sweet spot where you can still touch your toes and, and you're like, okay, this is, I'm retired, I'm, I'm good, we can travel, we have an RV, it's going to be great, we're going to drive around all the spots and I'm free then. I, I think the challenge is that sometimes and most times actually in life, uh, we, we only can point to moments when we felt free. Moments where, man, that was sweet, and then responsibility comes in, life comes in, uh, pain comes in, difficulty comes in, and we don't feel as free as we used to be. Uh, and Paul, I think, describes this <clears throat> when he says, hey, we went to Jerusalem, and, and people started to try to s- steal my freedom. They, they, they tried to bring us back into slavery, back into bondage. And he describes it like this. He says, I was I was." preaching the gospel for 14 years to people who didn't know Jesus. Uh, and they were called Gentiles. And I wonder if Paul would describe these 14 years as the, the season of his life where he felt the most alive, the most free, because he was going into places who, who didn't know Jesus and he was declaring that Jesus is king and, and come to Jesus and you'll be saved and come to Jesus and you'll uh, experience salvation and, and hundreds and thousands of people and churches were being established and planted and Paul would have been, this is an amazing time in my life and then he comes to Jerusalem and it's like a wet blanket uh, over his life. It's, it's suddenly like trying to, trying to jail and cage a bird. It's almost like the situation where he goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. For 14 years, I've been preaching the gospel, and now I come to Jerusalem, and you're trying to, to put me back into, into slavery. You're, you're trying to put me back into to bondage. And you know, I don't think that Paul's story is too dissimilar to some of the stories maybe we could tell. Like maybe you would tell a story like this, like, man, when I came to know Jesus and for the first time I knew Jesus, like I didn't know all the church protocol. Like I didn't know how to talk the talk at church and don't know how to behave, so I was kind of free from all the church politics. And I was, I was kind of free in my naivety, and I just worshiped God with boldness. I sang as loud as I could. I lifted my hands like a crazy person. I didn't know that, that you're supposed to do that in moderation. Or, or I wonder if, if maybe some of us would describe our lives like this, where when we first came to Jesus, his forgiveness was so sweet, and, and we left a life of, of addiction and pain and problems, and, and we heard the good news of Jesus. Wait, wait Jesus will forgive me? He'll, he'll redeem me? He'll set me free? And, and for maybe a few years, you, you embraced and enjoyed his freedom, but then your past started to creep back in, things that you used to do started to come back in, and, and although you maybe didn't feel guilty back then, suddenly you're, you're struggling with guilt again, and you're going, where are these feelings coming from? And it, it can kind of feel like, why, aren't, why am I being forced back into this situation where I feel guilty for what I used to do, but I thought God forgave me, and suddenly you find yourself kind of ridden with condemnation. Or maybe it's something where, where you... You used to look at life with bright eyes, and you believed the best in everybody. And there was a season in your life where you were free to hope that the other person across from you was a good person. But because of pain, because of struggle, because of difficulty, your pain has now become the lens that you view everybody. And it's almost like I was free, but now I'm not. For 14 years, I was good, but 
But I'm back in Jerusalem, and they're trying to put me in slavery again. Maybe the, the free season of your life was 14 days, 14 months. But I think all of us at some point face a situation that, that forces us back into some form of bondage, some form of slavery, some form of difficulty. You see, I'd like to go a little bit high. Can I do that? Can I go 30,000 feet for a little bit and, and discuss kind of a theological situation that we face in our world today? So, so Paul was facing people called Judaizers, and we've discussed this over the past few weeks. And Judaizers were basically saying that Jesus wasn't enough. You need Jesus and you need Jewish law. So they were saying, Paul, that's really cute that you've been traveling around uh, the Mediterranean in the Gentile churches and all you're preaching is Jesus. And if you'll just come to Jesus, then, then you'll be set free. But hey, we're Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. We know. And so what they were actually trying to say is that the, the gospel isn't enough. We need to add to it. Like we need to, we need to give some, the gospel some help. We need to encourage the gospel because I, I know what Jesus did on the cross was good and all, but like we had Moses, we had Abraham. We have, we have all these behaviors that you're supposed to follow as well. So, so in the past, we would look and go, well, they didn't think Jesus was enough. They needed to add to. And Paul calls them false teachers. And I wonder today, do we face false teachers? Or was that... Only something that people of the past faced. Is there anybody in our society, in our culture, who's trying to twist the truth? Trying to edit the gospel? Trying to teach us something that Jesus would have never... I mean, probably that only happened in the 12s, not in the 2021s, right? Like, we've, we've graduated from false teachers. I mean, right now, okay, no, anybody? Right now, is there any false teachers today? Thank you. Appreciate it. So if I look at the past, they would say that Jesus is not enough. We need to add to him. But in modern society, uh, in our new culture, we would say that Jesus goes too far. Like, I like what Jesus says about, like, forgiving people, but I don't like what Jesus says about sexual purity. So I'm going to edit that part out. It's like, I, I like what Jesus says about justice. Right, Jesus was for justice, but I don't like what Jesus says about personal generosity. And I think what ends up happening is we do the same thing that the Judaizers did when we go, well, Jesus really isn't enough, so let's add to him. Now what we do is go, well, Jesus is too much. He goes too far. He's not culturally appropriate anymore. He hasn't been modernized. So let's add, edit the parts that we feel like Jesus goes too far and keep the parts that we like. Both of them trying to view Jesus through their cultural lens, not viewing their culture through the lens of Jesus. So the Jewish people would go, well, our culture is we follow the rules, we do the things, we get circumcised, we follow the law, we have all these traditions. So I'm going to impose that upon Jesus. Today, we would say, well, culture has progressed, so therefore we must look through culture and interpret Jesus, not look through Jesus and interpret culture. You see, Paul is in a situation that we find ourselves in because we face what I would call progressive Christianity and Paul faced Judaizing Christianity. Well, we're trying to progress. We're trying to modernize the gospel. And the old was trying to keep it in the past. How many of you guys go to a restaurant with somebody and every time they go to the restaurant, they always have to edit the thing on the menu? Like you go to Applebee's, the pinnacle of culinary expression, <laughs> and you order your meal, and you don't like the way the culinary experts at Applebee's prepared it, so you're going to edit it. You're like, well, can you have this on the side? Can you put the sauce in a ramekin and bring that to me? And come on, if you're from Texas, you order ranch for everything. And so, like, like you, you have to edit. Or when you go to a burger place. Come on, how many of y'all in here are meat and cheese only burger people? Okay, we'll help you later. There's going to be something like that's the nastiest thing ever. But some of y'all do this, right? Some of y'all go like, okay, can I have a burger, uh, lettuce, no tomato? 
right? How many no tomato people on the burger? Uh, now, it's almost like walking into Gordon Ramsay's restaurant and say, Gordon, here's the deal. Like, I know how I like my food, and I know how food is supposed to be prepared. And I know if I edit this, you're probably going to use 13 F words on me, but I'm still going to do it. It's almost like, like we want to we take somebody whose their expertise at times is developing this culinary experience for us where the, the flavors and the, the expressions are so perfectly balanced and then we want to walk in, uh, people who put ketchup on our hot dogs, and we say this, I know how it's supposed to taste. Which, speaking of ketchup, how many of y'all spend $70 on a steak and put ketchup on your steak? If I got people who put ketchup on your steak, this is not the church for you. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. We love all people. We love you as you are. But we love you enough to not leave you where you are. We are going to help you. It's like we come to the gospel and we have this incredible creator that prepared the bread of life for us. The very sustenance in which we live. And we go, oh, Jesus, I, like, I know that you have your gospel and your word. But see, what it really needs is some A1. Or what can, Jesus, I'm not really into onions or mustard, so can you take that off? And I wonder if there is a church that will take the gospel as is, baby. Like, I don't need to edit it. I don't need to make substitutions. I don't need to add to it. I don't need to change it up. I don't need to build it based on my preferences. I don't need to say, well, I don't like that. That makes me uncomfortable. That rubs me the wrong way. Here's what I'll do. I'll take it as is. And if the Bible and I disagree, I'll assume I'm wrong. This pastor is mean. I don't like him. <laughs> you see, but Paul says the gospel works. And y'all are trying to steal my freedom. You see, the Judaizers were trying to steal freedom by asking Christians to obey the old law. And can I tell you that progressive Christians are trying to steal freedom just as much because they're trying to tell you obey 60% of the Bible and then 40% of your life is in bondage. The progressive says, do what feels good. But how many of you guys know that oftentimes our feelings lead us into traps that we should have never been in? How many felt like you wanted to tell them and let them know, and then afterwards you were like, listen, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean that. And they're like, yes, you did. You should have saw the vein on your forehead. You meant all of it. I think the best policy for a situation like that is, hey, listen, I'm sorry, and yes, I did mean it at the moment. It's a little more honest, isn't it? You see, but the best thieves find their way in our life without us even feeling it. They pickpocket our freedom, suddenly find ourselves with chains on our ankles, and that's where we find ourselves today is, is, is this situation where many believers and many people who think they're on a spiritual journey, not a journey of faith, uh, but one where they're just trying to feel the universe. Can I tell you this, that the only path to freedom is through Jesus, and he has crafted uh, uh, his word for you perfectly. I'll take it as is. I'll take it as is. But Paul, but Paul doesn't try to get into uh, academic acrobats with him. What he does with the, with the Jewish people, what he does is this. Let me just show you. Because how many of you guys know an example is always better than theory? Like, let me just show you. So Paul doesn't go to Jerusalem and just begin to argue with him. He goes, I've actually got somebody named Titus. And I'd love to show you Titus. Because Titus took the gospel as is without the law and without editing. He embraced the full gospel. And look at Titus. He's fully free. So while we would look at a minor detail in Galatians, what Paul is actually trying to show us is, is that I took Titus, a Gentile, a Greek, and brought him into the Holy Land, into the temple, and showed all of them up. Look, Titus! You see? He's free, and he doesn't need your circumcision, thank God. He's free, and he doesn't need your law. He's free, and he doesn't need anything extra. All he needed was Jesus. Now let me land this for a little bit. I wonder how many of us can be Timothys and Trishas when we walk into our world, into our culture, and say, guess what, baby? I'm free, and I took the gospel as is, and I am a living example that I can be free in Jesus while embracing all of his word. I wonder if there's some young people, there's some young adults, 
in my church that can, that can reject a hookup culture and find true freedom in following what Scripture says about their sexual life. I wonder if there's some successful career people. You make six figures. You're a big baller. But you've not accessed generosity because you think it's all yours. I earn this. But I wonder if you could experience the generous grace that God gives you through generosity. You see, I don't want to be financially independent because then it's all me. I want to be financially dependent. I want to be dependent on my provider, on my source, on my everything. No matter what comes, I'm dependent on him. And I wonder if there's a testimony that's going to come out of Victory City Church where we could be the Tituses of our modern culture and says we are free and all we needed was Jesus. All of him. Not 70% of him. Not the percentage that I agree with. I embraced all of him. And I think the problem and the challenge and why we don't do that is honestly because we misunderstand freedom. Like we believe freedom is getting to do what we want. When we want it, with who we want, whenever we want. Freedom is, I don't have anybody telling me what to do. Freedom is the machismo culture. Yeah, I'm a man. I do what I want. I'm a grown man. I got hair on my chest. Can I get an amen? And your wife says, yeah, you need to groom that mess. That's gross. I'm going to buy you some clippers. I'm a grown woman. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. We think freedom is free of restriction. We don't have anybody dictating for us. That's when I'm really free. Nobody tells me when to go to bed. Nobody tells me what to do with my money. Nobody tells me what to do with my time. Nobody tells me what to do, what, what I, what to do when I want to do it for my pleasure. I do what I want to do. See, I think this is a really, really immature and unrealistic view of freedom. It's like you're still seven years old. I want to eat all the sugar. I want to watch all the movies. I want to stay up as late as I possibly can. But how many of you guys know seven-year-olds that do that, and the next morning, they're sick? You see, I think it's in order to be financially free, I must at, at one point submit it to a budget. Unless you wanted to do what you want, and you didn't listen to your budget, then the next month, you didn't have any money. You see, a person who wants to be financially free submits themselves to the restriction of a budget, and then they become financially free. They submitted, but then they were free. Or what about the athlete who wants to be free to be the best athlete in the world must submit themselves to training and practice. They do not go, I'm not free. They go, I have to submit myself to a diet. I have to submit myself to training. I have to submit myself to practice, and then I can be free to be the best. What about a person in a marriage? I want to be free to have the best marriage possible. That means I am restricted to one woman. Because let me tell you, if there's lots of women, it ain't going to happen. Like, marriage ain't going to work. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I want to do what I want. Immature. True freedom is always found in submission to something. The question is, is what are you submitting to? What boundaries, what restrictions are you putting on your life to where you can be ultimately free? So if we don't put a budget in our life, we'll never be financially free. We'll always be chasing credit card, credit card, credit card. We'll always be living paycheck to paycheck to paycheck without it. But we would not look at someone submitting to their budget and call them a slave. We wouldn't call them in bondage. We would say, you're in the pursuit of financial freedom. And so my question for you today is, who's stolen your freedom? What have you submitted yourself to that has actually restricted your life and not opened your life up? I think sometimes we submit ourselves to academia. Well, I'm a science person and all that kind of stuff. But the problem is, is that science doesn't answer some of the deepest questions of our heart. Like, science doesn't explain why I love my wife. Science doesn't explain certain things that are deep within my soul. But when we lock ourselves to only academics and science, suddenly we have a limited worldview because they're just deeper things that it can't answer. You see how what you submit yourself to actually reveals to what you can be free from? I think in an attempt to be free and independent, oftentimes we reject the whole gospel but find ourselves in more bondage. 
Galatians chapter 2, verse 4 says this, Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they may bring us into slavery. So let's get real personal. Let's get really practical. I wonder how many people in here have said, I've let fear slip in. And fear is no longer pragmatic. The fear that I'm experiencing in my life is almost a level of paranoia. So, so we allow fear to slip in, and we don't even feel it. We don't even notice it, but suddenly we find ourselves consumed with fears and, and what ifs and this could happen. And, and, and we live our life in bondage, not even being able to sleep because we're so worried about what may happen. And we find ourselves in chains of fear. I think validation is another one. We're constantly needing to be validated by other people. And we can't ever live our life because we have to live the life that gets the most validation. Will people like me? Will people think I'm good? Will people, people believe the reputation I'm trying to build? So in pursuit of validation, we actually become, uh, become slaves to their opinions. We become slaves to how they feel about us. Come on, millennials and under, we struggle when, when we don't get 15 likes on our Instagram. Nobody loves me. Why did anybody comment hearts on my picture? So we try to create captions that create a little caveat. Felt cute, might delete later. And if it doesn't get the amount of pictures, we delete it. The likes. And here's the deal. It's so simple, but you know it's true. It creates mental health problems. And that's why I would say, what are you in bondage to? It slips in. Unnoticed. Oh my goodness, why do all of a sudden I care about other people's opinions so much? Like I used to not care at all, but suddenly I care so much. What about the thing that you thought I'd just do for fun? Like the pleasure that was in your life? Like I just do this on the weekends, I do it to kind of hang loose, I do it to decompress, suddenly becomes the prison you live in. Suddenly becomes the only way you experience life. You see, you see how something can just slip in and steal your freedom that you had in Christ? And suddenly fi you find yourself addicted to the thing that you only did occasionally. It wasn't overnight. It wasn't like something I went from, from somebody who dabbled to somebody who was addicted to it. It was something that was just slight. I fell asleep and my money was gone. I wonder how many people struggle with insecurity. Never feeling enough. Even though the God of the universe has called them son and daughter, they, they, they feel so insecure, and so therefore they settle in every area of their life. Well, I can't really find a man of God who really loves the Lord, so i got to find a man of God, well, not a boy of God. Actually, no, he's not even a boy of God. He's an orphan of God, and he comes to church only when I force him to. And so, like, because I feel so unworthy and so insecure that, that a, a true man of God would never love me, I'll settle. I'll settle for the job. I'll settle for the person. I'll settle for the life. I settle, settle. And it all starts with this insecurity that comes in. Just slipping in, trying to steal our freedom. I wonder if today the thing that holds hold of your life the false narrative in your life, the false teaching you have believed. I wonder how we break free from that. I wonder how we look at the people, the false teachers, and we declare today, stop stealing my freedom. I wonder, 10 a.m., if you today, this morning, can declare and look at the false narratives in your life and say, stop insecurity stealing my freedom. Stop the need for validation stealing my freedom. Stop addiction stealing my freedom. Stop past pain stealing my freedom. Stop past guilt stealing my freedom. Come on, church. Can we declare today, stop stealing my freedom? Stop it. So Paul tells us, to them we did not yield. In submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So how do I not yield? Try harder? Come on, how many of you guys have tried harder and it doesn't work? 
You've tried to grip it. You've tried to figure it out. You were saying, this time is for real. And you make these big confessionals. You even post something on social media. Hey, everybody, here's what I'm doing. It doesn't get enough likes. You delete it. You tell your wife, this time is for real. And the first six times she believes you, but the seventh, she's like, okay, babe. Yeah, I'll believe it when I see it. I hope so. And then you're patronized. Is really trying harder the best way? See, that's not gospel. Jesus does not look at you and go, try harder, believer. Jesus says, just believe in me and and I'll do it for you. Jesus says, come to me and I'll give you grace. Jesus, come to me and he says, I'll give you my spirit, which we're going to be talking about in the next few weeks. Jesus says, I'll give you the Holy Spirit that empowers you, that gives you strength. It's not about trying harder. It's about coming to me. It's about taking the gospel as is. So how do I recognize the lies that try to steal my freedom? How do I recognize the false teachers that are trying to put me in bondage? You see, I think the best way to recognize a lie is to know the truth. I know, I just blew your minds. (laughs) How does he come up with this? The best way To recognize a lie is to know the truth really, really well. So let's do a little experiment. Class participation. I'm grading all of you, so I need participation. Who killed JFK? Mafia, CIA, anybody? Nobody? I know all my, like, Gen Zers are like, who is JFK? I don't, I haven't, does he have a TikTok handle? I don't know him. Is he like a, is he a SoundCloud rapper? I don't know. YouTube personality, like, comment, and subscribe. No, here's the deal. JFK was a president that was shot. Okay, okay, right. Here's the deal. You, you, you don't know, and you get lots of different. Why? Because the truth isn't there. Now, here's another really fun experiment. I'm going to do this. What is two plus two? Is it five? Is it six? Is it seven? Is it eight? Come on, y'all, you're, you're trailing. Is it nine? Is it 37? Is it 114? Is it 1,646? Okay, is it 10,781? Meaning this, there's only one option. That means that all the other options are not true. So I can either waste my time chasing all the other options, or I can get to know the one truth, and if I know the one truth, every other option is not true. And I think we spend our lives chasing down all these other paths going, is this true? Will this work? Well, well can I go here? And so, so we chase the, the success. Maybe success will give me. Oh, no. Oh, or maybe, maybe he will complete me. Oh, no, that doesn't. You know, I'm just going to try atheism for a season. Oh, oh, no, that doesn't work either. And we try all these other paths, and Jesus is going, four. Four. And we go, God, listen, I, th- I, listen, I really think. I've done the math. I've watched some YouTube videos. I think it's 118. It's not. It's not. So we even try to like get close. We say, well, maybe three. And we call it spirituality. We were talking in the back. My friend Jeff was telling me his boss sends him sage to cleanse him. Can I tell you, sage is only good in a dish. The blood of Jesus is the only thing that cleanses our life. So so John chapter 8, he says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. You've been allowing people to steal your freedom because you've been listening to false narratives. Listen to the truth. So I'm going to give you something really practical as I land the plane. You, you can put it into your life this afternoon. Don't take a nap. Do this. Number one, simple thought is this. Just meditate on God's word. Psalms 1 verse 2. Again, we're, we're wanting to get to know the truth. What does the truth say? I want to get to know what God says. I want to take the gospel as is. I want to find freedom that only Jesus can give me. It says, but delight in his law, in his word. 
And in his law, meditate day and night. I think we spend so, many other, so much other time in our life. We open up the email. We open up social media. We turn on the TV. One of the most convicting things you can do is look in your settings and take a look at your screen time. And see what app you're being discipled by. Is it Facebook? Does the Facebook have a larger voice in your life than Jesus does? And this isn't meant to like beat you over the head and go like, quit getting on Instagram and get in the Bible. No, no, it's going, listen, you want to know the truth? Get with Jesus. That's why on August 8th is the Sunday we're starting. We're going to be doing as a church something called 21 Days of Prayer and Fasting. And because of your generosity as a church, we've actually purchased prayer journals for the whole church. We've custom made them for you. And we're giving every person who comes on, April, or on August 8th a free prayer journal. And we're going to be journeying through the book of, book of Galatians all together, spending time in God's Word. And the reason I want to do that is for, for those who are just beginning, I want to teach you how to get into God's Word. For those who have maybe had it for a while but left it, I want to get you back into God's Word. And then even on those Friday nights, which I know everybody tells me, like football in Texas is a big deal, but I think Jesus is bigger. On those, on those Friday nights, we're going to be doing worship and prayer nights to get close to God. And we're going to go, hey, you know, we can go out on a Friday night or we can spend time with Jesus in, in, his, in worship and in His presence. You see, what I'm trying to do is this, is if we can just meditate on the truth, we recognize the lie. Second really crazy thought for you is this. This one's deep. Don't post it, Austin, because I, I want the punchy thing. I want it to like the reveal. This is crazy. This is going to help you stay free. This is going to help you recognize lies. Really here. Ready? Come back to church. Twitter servers just shut down because of all of you tweeting that. Come back to church. You go, what does church have to do? You see, if I can get around a house of freedom, I find myself becoming more free. If I can get around free people, I find myself becoming more free. And I think I want to push against this idea that church is something that can supplement your faith. The church is the bedrock of your faith. Jesus actually tells us, love my church. Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. You see, when we gather together as a church, what we do is we say, hey, we all live these separate lives, but we have this one unifying thing that is Jesus and his mission here on earth. And until I'm in heaven, I am committed to building his church. So I'm not going to come when it's convenient. I'm not going to come when I have time. I'm going to reorder my life to be a part of God's church. You see, if we can, if we can organize our lives for a seven-year-old's t-ball schedule, can I tell you we can organize our lives for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we can say, Jesus, I'm going to do this. You see, that's why we want you in connect groups. That's why we want you on a serve team. That's why we want you participating in generosity. Because we know that if we can get you around free people, you will become free. And I think it's interesting that in Matthew chapter 7, 14, it says this, For the gate is narrow and the way is hard. You know, Christians were first called people of the way. In Antioch, they were, they were people that followed the way of Jesus. And I think our world provides so many different ways. They tell you, try what feels good. Chase what looks good to you. But, but Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says, follow the way. And I think when we can get around people of faith who are following the way, suddenly we find ourselves not alone, not desperate, not lost. Because how many of you guys know that when you feel alone, you feel like you're losing every battle? And how many of you guys, you, you, because you felt like you had nobody in your life, you go, why even try anymore? Why am I even trying this? And you want to give up, but can I tell you that there's a church here in Victory City and every single person here that will say, walk with me on the way. Get with me. Get behind me. Get in front of me. 
Come on, how many of you guys know there's some people in your life where you're like, I'm not leaving you behind because you'll trail off. You're going to get in front of me, and even if i got to push you this way, I'm going to push you because I'm not letting you fall off. I'm not letting you get into slavery. And you know what? You can be annoyed at them, and you can ghost their text messages, but church, can I tell you, stay behind them. Keep pushing them towards Jesus. Keep pushing them on the way, and I tell you, they'll find freedom. So I want to close with this thought is that Paul says, I did not yield, so I held on to the gospel for you. Paul's saying, I didn't edit Jesus or add to Jesus. I stayed true to Jesus, and I didn't let them steal my freedom. They weren't allowed to steal my freedom because only Jesus gives me freedom. But he says, I did it for you, Galatian church. I did it so that when I left there, I could could take freedom even further. I could take freedom to Rome. I could take freedom to Ephesus. I could take freedom to, to Corinth. I could take freedom all over the Mediterranean. I could take freedom to Austin, Texas. I could take freedom to Hutto, Pflugerville, Round Rock, Manor. Heard somebody the other day call it Manor, like you ain't from here. I could take freedom to you to your life. So let me ask you this really simple question is that's this. Who in your life right now will benefit when you don't yield? Mothers, will your homes benefit when you don't yield? Will your homes become a place of freedom, not chaos? Or peace, not fighting? Come on, young people, young adults, young couples, you got friends in your life and, and who will benefit because you didn't yield but you remain an example for them. You say, I don't have to go that way. Let me show you true freedom. And suddenly people start asking you questions like, why are you always happy? Why do you always go to church? What's all this about? How come you guys are never financially in a pinch? Man, listen, I'm free in Jesus. Let me show you. Let me talk to my husbands. Come on, husbands. Don't make your wife drag you to church. Don't make your wife twist your arm. Babe, we really need to go to church. Ah, oh, I'm busy. Got to mow the lawn. Uh, come on. Will the home that you lead benefit when you don't yield to slavery? When you stand strong in freedom? What are the generations beyond you that will enjoy the freedom that you stood in? I'm a product of that. My great-grandmother was a prostitute on 6th Street. My grandmother used to follow her from from appointment to appointment to appointment, and that's being polite. Would go to the bars and watch watch my great-grandmother pick up men. Until one day someone knocked on her door and said, would you like to come to church? She said yes, walked into a church and experienced freedom that then affected generations. Generations. So who's three, four-year generations beyond you? Who are you going to go, I'm not going to yield, but I'm going to know the truth. So enemy, false teachers, devil, world, culture, stop stealing my freedom. Stop stealing my freedom. I wonder today, Church Victory City, that's why why we're not a young church. We're not an old church. We're not a middle-aged church. We're a generational church. Because I believe what we do here is affecting family members you had not even met yet. But they're down the line. Because I want freedom for you. Will you stand with me this morning? Jesus, we just pray right now someone has has allowed fear to creep into their life. Not someone has allowed anxiety, the need for validation, not the thing that was once for pleasure now becomes a prison in their life. And God, I pray for them today. God, I pray in Jesus' name that they find freedom in this moment right here.
that God, I pray that they would come to know the truth that is Jesus. God, I pray that they would come back to the truth that is Jesus. And, and I pray that today we are able to, able to declare, stop stealing my freedom. And the enemy has to run. And freedom has to come in. Because Jesus says he knocks on the door and wants to come in. And I believe today there are people here that have never made a decision to follow Jesus. They've dabbled in it. They've tried to get as close as they could without fully committing. There's people who have run from it. There's people who have, who once began but slipped away. But today is the day that they fully come back. Today is the day that they make a decision to follow you, Jesus. And if you're here this morning and you want to you make a decision, you want to surrender your life, you want to invite Jesus into your heart, I want to lead you in a prayer, and I want you to pray this prayer. I want you to make these words your own. And as a family, we're going to pray with you because we are so happy that you're going to experience freedom today. And I want you to pray this simple prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, today I make a decision in my life to follow you. I confess you, Lord, of my life. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for the grace you give me. Thank you, Jesus, that right now I'm experiencing freedom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.